you look at any indigenous population from anywhere in the world, there were women warriors. Back then in the, the Red Power Movement days, it's the same today, it's, it's all about land. Indigenous land struggles all over the, the planet. This isn't just about Indians, you know, wanting their little piece of, in, in history. We are the history. Coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Twenty twenty three marks the fiftieth anniversary of the occupation of Wounded Knee, perhaps the best known Native American protest of the nineteen seventies. Among the famous photos of that era from the civil rights movement and the anti war protest years, that picture of indigenous activists facing off against National Guard troops, U.S. Marshals, and the FBI there in the snowy plains of South Dakota is one of the iconic images of the time. Perhaps you know there was a 71-day standoff, a federal agent was paralyzed, and two Native American activists lost their lives. What you might not know is how the whole thing got started and the role that indigenous women played. The fact is, it was indigenous grandmothers and respected elders who decided that after years of trying to address corruption on the Pine Ridge Reservation and broken U.S. government treaties, dating back to the original 1890 massacre of Wounded Knee, it was women who decided it was time to take a stand, and that's what they did. The absence of women in the history of that moment and in the American Indian movement, or AIM itself, is part of what a new project called the Warrior Women Project is working to fix. Over the last many years, documentarian Elizabeth Castle has been interviewing indigenous women activists and building an astonishing archive. This month, in conjunction with the anniversary, the project is opening an interactive exhibit in Porcupine, near the site of the occupation. Along with the oral histories and exhibition, Castle also co-directed a documentary, Warrior Women, which introduced me to the two extraordinary guests I have the honor of having with me today. Madonna Thunderhawk and Marcella, or Marcy Gilbert, are mother-daughter organizers who were involved not only in Wounded Knee, but to judge from the documentary in just about every Red Power uprising from the 60s to Standing Rock in 2016. Marcy grew up in the movement for indigenous self-determination and was a student at the We Will Remember Survival School that her mother founded back in the day. Today, her work focuses on food sovereignty and cultural revitalization. Her mother, Madonna, established that school and went on to do many things, among them become the tribal liaison for the Lakota People's Law Project in their fight to stop the illegal removal of native children from tribal nations. They are both joining us from their home on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, and I couldn't be happier to have them join me at this very exciting time. And let's start with you, Marcy. Um, there's going to be a lot happening around this anniversary. Are you going to be taking part? And, and what do you think people will see who are there? When the planning was happening, I was like, okay, which days am I going to be there? You know, what am I going to be doing? Because I knew it was a big deal. So I started looking at the agenda, and every day... They're honoring, we and others are honoring members of my family. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I got to be there for all four days. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Madonna? What are you looking forward to? What will you be doing in this anniversary? I'm an elder now, so, you know, I don't have to worry about details and running around and organizing. You know, the younger ones can do that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very excited. Uh, hopefully we'll get to see some of the... Uh, veterans of uh, Wounded Knee 73, uh, those of us that are left, uh, that will come in from all over the country, you know. It's going to be an, an amazing time. In the film, Warrior Women, this scene plays out with women, including Madonna and Marcella, talking with others about what happened there at Wounded Knee. When I think of, of my people, Indian people, I think of course of Wounded Knee because that was the awakening. That was the awake, the, ri the rise of our people. When we 
know now that, that there is going to be increased hostile activity against the American Indian movement. With that, AIM must also increase its activity. Wounded Knee, what we were just on our way through. A lot of different stories of what happened with different people, because not everybody got the same information. I was there, so this is what I can remember it happened. There was always, always a committee or a group of people that would request our presence. They wanted us to come down to the reservation and meet in the little community of Calico. We were just gonna go for the day and be back in Rapid that night. We got word that Porcupine community wanted us over there because they knew we were on the res. We had to turn off and go north through Wounded Knee. We had a whole bunch of cars. I was like in the middle. And I happened to look over towards the BIA building and I noticed there was a lot of, looked like military vehicles. And then I looked on top of the BIA building and there was sandbags and you could see barrels of big guns. I don't know what they thought we were doing. We were coming through town, you know. It wasn't planned. I mean, I had my 10-year-old son with me. Well, I think the federal people are just itching to come in here and annihilate the entire population. That's what it looks like. The local bureau officials don't seem to realize it. They've been so used to pushing Indians around. They've pushed us around for years and years. Well, this is the last stand here. There was gunfire in Wounded Knee for the second consecutive night. We knew when there was going to be a firefight. And one night, they opened up. I could just feel it going over my head, those tracers. And I thought, yeah, I thought I was dead. The first blood that was spilled at this Wounded Knee episode was spilled Thursday night in a gun battle in which two young Indians were wounded. It was very, very real. I didn't know if I was going to see my mom and brother again. And the news, we were the terrorists, we were the militants. Yeah, and, they made it know. sound like you guys had all these guns and mm -hmm. all yeah. these weapons and... There was only one AK-47. Bobby was carrying that, <laughs> behind <laughs> us, carrying that AK, and then no, no ammo for it or nothing, you know. But it's walking up like that, and here we turned around, and he said, oh, now, nah, look at this guy. Just because the, the press is in here, look at him, you know. He said, yeah, man, he went like this, and here they took his picture. <laughs> famous picture of Wounded Knee with this warrior with the AK and here. We were just teasing him and raising cane with him. That's why he's just laughing. <laughs> After about a week into being in Wounded Knee, oh, it was nice. The sun was shining. It was just a warm breeze. And then some guys walked by. They were just enjoying the day, too. And they came walking by. Hey, Madonna, what's happening? I said, oh, that's really nice. I said, and that's when I really realized that there's very few people that experience true freedom. And that was one of them. Physical freedom. But also mentally, you know, physically, everything, emotionally. Now I understand why, why my ancestors did what they did. Are there things that you think we misunderstand, we outside of the community misunderstand about the American Indian movement? Has absolutely painted a negative picture. It's always about the violence. It's always about guns, you know, that kind of thing. But you look at what, what the movement actually accomplished and continues to accomplish. You know, the survival schools alternative um, education that didn't exist back then and and specifically for native children you know we it, it didn't exist um the um international indian treaty council i was a youth delegate that got to go to the first you know the first trip that we went as a nation to the united nations and that work continues today on the pine ridge reservation the the KI Ally radio station, that was a product of the American Indian movement. There was a um, health clinic to provide adequate health care to, to our people. That was a product of the American Indian movement. I mean, there's so, there's tons of stuff out there that 
people don't believe or don't know because the media painted, you know, the government painted a picture that we're, we're, we're a group that needs to be, again, terminated. You tell the backstory about that image of Bobby Anka with his AK-47 in that clip we just played. Madonna, I mean, we can laugh about it, and you do, but it made the whole situation much more dangerous, it seems to me. Are there things you would add to what Marcy said about how the misrepresentation of that moment affected your lives? We knew about how biased the press was already. They had been, you know, the years that we were we, before Wounded Knee and after. So we knew what was going to happen. We knew it was going to, how they were going to look at us and, and paint the picture, you know, of uh, militants and we stand alone. You know, nobody was going to put out the, the true story. And we knew that because we had no press. There was no native press. After Wounded Knee, when, when um, everybody was taken into jail and, you know, criminalized immediately for, I don't know what, that, that's still like, what did we do wrong? You know, <laughs> I don't know what we did wrong. But the media participated in determining what we did wrong. And so, you know, one of the things that stood out to me was, you know, my mom was looking at 120 years in prison because of the media. The media implanted that fear. Leonard Peltier is, I believe, in his 40. 40- eighth year of incarceration, despite many, many global efforts calling for um, clemency for him. Native American activist there at Wounded Knee. Madonna, how do you connect his story and the campaign around his incarceration to what you're doing today? His story is, is like the modern day history of, of what happens to, to our people. It isn't about him personally about his charges or what he did. It's, it's what the FBI had done at the time and what they're covering up. When I looked at the history, not your history, but the history in the you know so-called mainstream, it's all about guys and mostly guys with guns. How does putting women in the picture change that story, Madonna? Well, I think you know it changes the story for those outside of, of our world, outside of the you know, um, Indian communities, territory, because we've always known it's been that way. You know, we've never had to singly say women should be, you know, talked about. We, we've known that, you know, generation after generation. It's the outside world that doesn't know. And how would you answer the question, Marcy? I, I believe that it's going to strengthen our women and bring back our societies within our communities. We had societies of women that had responsibilities that kept our communities healthy and vibrant and and powerful and you know we had a made sure we had a future and so and and those are slowly starting to reform themselves now but this part of it we really in our history all of us you look at any indigenous population from anywhere in the world there were women warriors and so what the warrior women project offers is our right to exist as warriors to protect our people. And so we had warrior women societies. And so I, I believe the future is, is, you know, empowering women. It, it's a woman's future. I mean, look what's happening, it, you know. It isn't just happening among our people. It's happening everywhere. Women are powerful. And so... We're taking our place in that movement. I'm going to play the trailer from the film Warrior Women, which I think makes this point very strongly. This country is built on the bones of our ancestors. We have our culture, we have our way of life, we have our language. What we're trying to do is retain it. Retain our right as a people to be Indian. It was truly an empowering, free 
time. Watching the women is amazing how they handle everything. Protecting our people and our, our children's future and fighting, being warriors in that way. The press, they just automatically gravitated to the men. And who really knew what was going on and was really running the show were the women. We were a movement of families. Being the daughter of Madonna, she definitely had a reputation of being strong. And when someone went to her for help, she did what she had to do to make a difference. However we get the job done, you know, whatever it takes. The Warrior Women Project goes beyond your two narratives. Tell me how, what, what's the project doing, Madonna? I think it's very important because many of the women uh, interviews and voices in the archives, they've passed on, they're, they're gone. And if it wasn't for this archives, a lot of their stories wouldn't be known. And maybe, you know, in, in families handed down stories, but uh, generally speaking, because of the way uh, patriarchy and the way uh, the whole system was set up before there were, were uh, for example, we didn't have native media back in the day, which we have now, nowadays, you know? So yeah, I think it's, it's very, very important. We were totally disregarded. And so this, this archive is, is, is very important. It gives our young people the whole history. It, is, it wasn't just the guys. I mean, the women, the women told the line. How does this work connect with your work at the school, Madonna, and why you founded that school? It wasn't so much of a, a sitting around and holding meetings and talking about it. We just did it, you know. That's what the children want. And here's our chance, you know. I wasn't an educator. I had no clue. But I knew everyday living, and I knew what we didn't have as far as our own history. So, yeah, it was a good time for us to learn right along with the, the, the young people on on how to do this. But our history was there and our history was solid and we knew it. When I first went, I was handed the 1868 treaty and said, you need to know this, read it. Why are our treaties so important? We learned, you know, water rights, Winter's Doctrine, 1868 treaties, our re relation, the relationship, nation to nation, what does that mean? What are, what are the obligations that this country has to us? I, I'm part of a nation that has a very unique relationship with this government and they're accountable to me. And to learn that as a young person, you know, you're like, hey man, don't mess around with me, you know? It, it, it was very empowering to learn that I stood for something, I mean something in this country. So very powerful. And how would you see the connection between that empowerment and education work and the Warrior Women Project that you're involved in now? The Warrior Women Project keeps that kind of mentality and that kind of education moving, you know, moving forward so that young people or anybody who gets involved with the, with the project realizes that this isn't just about Indians, you know, wanting their little piece of, in, in history. We are the history of this, you know, this country. We are the history. One of the interviews done for the Warrior Women Project is with Geraldine Janice. Tell us a little bit about who she is, Madonna, and why this story was so important to capture for the project. She wouldn't call herself a leader, but she was. She was a community leader. Just by her presence and, and, and understanding um, what the issues were, it wasn't, like we said, it was not a protest. The issues go deeper and they're all land-based and she knew this, but she also knew that um, the strengths of community, which was, was women. We do a protest from the tribal office and the goons that just push the women aside and laugh at us. Mm -hmm. And the marshals were on top of the BIA building. They acted like we had guns, you know? Right. And we didn't have anything. See, they, they found out we weren't afraid of them. 
we told them to go ahead and shoot us if they wanted to, but we wanted our rights for the people. The fact that Beth got her interview and her story is amazing because it's, it's, for, it's for all of us, not just her descendants, her family and her great grandchildren and whatever, but for all of our people. You call them the matriarchs of Wounded Knee. Oh yeah, they were that, that's what they were to us because they provided the leadership. They, they, you know, they were there and they're the ones that called, called, you know, called us out and said, you know, yeah, we know there's police brutality going on all over the border towns in South Dakota, but uh, here's what's going on back home on your reservation. Where do you see your movement standing now in relation to others? You know, the connections back then in the, the Red Power Movement days is the same today. It's, it's all about land. Indigenous land struggles all over the, the planet. Wherever colonization happened and, and is happening, as always the indigenous has always been a land struggle. Whether it's in Northern Ireland, whether it's here in, in our territory, Dakota, Lakota territory, or if it's in Palestine. It's an indigenous struggle and it always starts with the land. The issue is never going to change because the colonizers want, they're always going to want your land. And so the movements are like breathing, living things. You know, we grow like Standing Rock. Standing Rock was amazing because we, we um, rejuvenated our people with, with knowledge and leadership and connectivity. You know, so Standing Rock was, you know, not only did it bring all of our, all of the indigenous people together of this hemisphere, but, but the non-indigenous too, because everybody understands the value of water. Madonna, coming back to you on some of the challenges facing us all, especially indigenous people, but everyone today, as we look at climate change and so much more. Do you find there might be answers to some of our challenges in those oral histories that are part of the Warrior Women Project? Well, yeah, I do. And I think that's one of the strengths that helps us, those of us that choose to take on the responsibility of carrying this on and the dedication, it takes dedication too, you know. But for for example, my station in life now as, 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 as an elder, you know, I work in, within the, the community of elders, elderly women, you know, and uh, we have to learn not, not only how to carry on our, 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 our um, teaching from the past, but also how does that relate to the modern day? It's helped me to, to understand and see that not it isn't all a tale of woe, you know. We're still here and we're surviving in this, in this uh, land of, uh, you know, colonization. Um, and that our, our teachings from our ancestors are strong. The oral histories are streaming online. There's a website that we can direct people to through our website. The film, Warrior Women, is available. Again, we'll put more information at our website. Madonna Thunderhawk and Marcy Gilbert, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Putting women in the picture does change the story. Growing up in the 1970s in the not-so-United Kingdom, for example, I was aware that there was some kind of trouble going on in Northern Ireland, but I didn't know what it was about. As an English person, in our newspapers, the cartoons depicted scary guys with guns and bombs and black berets and trench coats who wanted to blow us all away. We were trained to be scared and afraid and kind of angry about the inconvenience of bomb threats. But we didn't know much more than that. It wasn't until later that I heard there were women involved in that struggle, women political prisoners behind bars, women who'd taken up arms, women who'd left home and family and community. I wondered what did they care so deeply about that they would do all that? It was finding that there were women in the picture that changed the story for me, provoked my curiosity, and not just mine alone. Is that how sexism works? Yeah, kind of. Having women in the picture 
made it more complex. I wrote about that in the introduction to a book of essays called Real Majority Media Minority. You can find it on our website. You can find my full conversation with today's guests about the difference that women made to the red power struggle through a subscription to our podcast, which you can also find out about at our website. Till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. Thanks for joining me for The Laura Flanders Show. I'm Laura. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.